guiding policy. Carol Bruner, who spoke at Cato's first monetary conference, pointed to the importance According to Bruner, quote, we neither we suffer neither under total ignorance nor do we enjoy full knowledge. A non-activist, that is rules-based regime, emerges under the circumstances as the safest strategy. It does not assure us that economic fluctuations will be avoided, but it will assure us that monetary policy does not impose additional uncertainties on the marketplace. With this large staff of economists and access to massive amounts of data, the Fed missed forecasting the 2008 financial crisis and missed warning signs of the current inflation. At a forum, in, at a forum hosted by the ECB in June, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell stated, quote, we now understand better how little we understand about inflation, close quote. I hope today's conference will help shed light on the causes of inflation and provide positive lessons for improving monetary policy. Before moving to the first, Carol J. Bowen Jr. and Duval Bowen Family Foundation for supporting today's event. I'd also like to thank Cato's excellent staff for helping with the conference, especially Nick Anthony and Kiana Graham, as well as David Tassi and Jonathan Fields. Finally, thanks to all our speakers and moderators for taking time from your busy schedules to join us. Now let's begin with Fed Chairman Jay Powell and Peter Gettler, President and CEO of the Cato Institute. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Jim said, I'm Peter Gettler. It's my honor and privilege to be president of the Cato Institute. Before proceeding, I want to offer my congratulations to you, Jim. Cato has been an important voice in the monetary realm for over four decades. And while there are lots of people who have contributed to this, no one has contributed more to this work than our colleague, Jim Dorn. He's played a role, as large a role as anyone. Uh, Jim inaugurated our monetary conference, and under his leadership, it's become an annual institution. Jim's presided over each of these conferences, including today's, which, as he pointed out, is our 40th. Following these past 40 years of service to Cato and our mission, during which he also created and edited our Cato Journal, Jim will be retiring later this month and will assume the title of Senior Fellow Emeritus at the Institute. Jim, I just wanted to offer our heartfelt thanks for your many contributions as one of the longest tenured employees in Cato's history. And I offer you best wishes for a fruitful and enjoyable retirement. I know you'll continue to make your voice heard in the policy debates and in the policy world, but I also hope you reserve plenty of time to enjoy your, your wonderful family. Uh, and now let's turn to a 40th annual monetary conference. It's my honor and pleasure to welcome Fed Chair Jerome Powell to the conference. Along with Alan Greenspan and Ben Bernanke, he's now the third chair of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors to address the conference. Jerome Powell was first appointed as chair in 2018 and then reappointed this past spring. And he's no stranger to the Fed. Prior to his time as chair, he served as a member of the Board of Governors starting just over 10 years ago. That is okay. The one certainty that seems to come with the position of Fed chair is that one will invariably face a time of great challenge. Paul Volcker confronted our last and worst bout of inflation. Alan Greenspan saw the stock market crash a mere two months after his confirmation. And Ben Bernanke led the Federal Reserve amidst the financial crisis of 2007 and 2008. And Chairman Powell, as we all know, has served throughout the COVID-19 pandemic and its aftermath, a period in which we've seen inflation reach its highest level in 40 years. As we've sat in front of Zoom screens over the past two and a half years, I'll just speak for myself. Many of us have watched as our hair has turned grayer but few of us have as good an excuse for this as Chairman Powell. We're delighted to have him with us today to have a conversation about key policy issues, what he's learned, and the challenges now facing the Fed. Chairman Powell, it's good to see you today, sir. Welcome. Thank you very much, Peter. And thank you to, a, go ahead. I don't think it's a failure of imagination on my part, nor do I believe anyone will be surprised at the first topic we turn to is inflation. Um, you know, as Jim mentioned, it seems policymakers were given, including at the Fed, were initially given a bit of a head fake on inflation. We heard policymakers ascribing the increase in, in price inflation to the pandemic and related supply disruptions. And while this has undoubtedly contributed, there seems a much stronger consensus now that it's been in larger part policy. Driven. <clears throat> Can you discuss for us or give us some insight into how your thinking evolved on, uh, on this topic over the last year and a half? and how those conclusions may have uh, may have evolved as well. 
So, Peter, thank you, and Jim, thank you, and congratulations to both of you and to Cato on 40 years of, of great uh, monetary policy conferences. So I, I think a good entry point for, for that question, Peter, is to start by recalling that before the pandemic, uh, unemployment was at a 50-year low, inflation was low and stable, and the economy was growing stable, sorry, steadily, uh, with no obvious imbalances threatening continued expansion. So, of course, in that sense, none of this high inflation that we see around the world now would have happened without the pandemic. Um, uh, the pandemic severely disrupted the economy, gave rise to risks of much more dire economic consequences than actually transpired, it, really. And that was thanks in part to the policy response. So um, to start with policy, there's no question that policy certainly supported strong demand. But in my view, you would not have seen anything like the inflation that we have seen without the pandemic effects. And those pandemic effects include both shifts, shifts in demand and also playing a, a, a role in, not solely causing, but playing a role in the supply side constraints that emerged. So as for the pandemic, um, it, it did lead directly to an extraordinary shift in demand away from in-person services and to goods. And that shift, of course, was a major contributor to inflation in goods prices, which was really the main inflation story at the very beginning when, when, when inflation broke out suddenly in March of, of uh, 2021. It's worth remembering that inflation actually declined in the early stage of the pandemic and then, and then suddenly rose up in March of 21. Um, the pandemic also contributed to the constraints to constrain supply in a number of important ways, including uh, a large and persistent reduction in the size of the labor force, which contributed to extremely tight lab, uh, labor market conditions and upward pressure on wages. Also, the turmoil in global supply chains was probably caused by, to some extent, by pandemic-related shutdowns as well as strong demand, uh, and particularly goods demand. I, I think cars are, are a good example. So, yes, people had money and rates were low and demand for cars was strong, but also the pandemic shifted demand, and, uh, shifted demand upward for cars because some people wanted to avoid public transportation. That amped up new demand. Uh, demand for new and used cars, and, and also the shortage of semiconductors for cars emerged from pandemic-related demand shifts as well. So, uh, you know, the bottom line for me uh, is that there's really a role for both here, and the two are tangled up in a, in a way that it's really not easy to disentangle. The, uh, you know, those of us who grew up in the 70s, uh, I think that the uh, danger and cost of inflation, you know, can't be exaggerated. Uh, in September of 1979, his first testimony, a month after he was confirmed, Paul Volcker made clear he understood the, the damage that was being caused by inflation and the need to bring it down, even if it required uh, great costs in other, other economic ways. Uh, one of the lessons of that episode was the greater the extent to which inflation slips the leash, the higher the cost and greater economic damage necessary to bring it under control. Uh, I worry whether we have the resolve to bring inflation under control today to face the potential economic costs. I took some comfort from your recent remarks in Jackson Hall, which seemed an attempt to signal that kind of resolve. But I do remain concerned that, you know, the intense political pressure that might be brought to bear to avoid collateral eco economic damage before the inflation fight is won. And I, I just wondered if there's any way you can help me sleep a little bit better on that score. Um, sure. So I think it's worth going back and remembering, uh, and I pointed this out in my remarks last week, two weeks ago at Jackson Hole, 10 days ago, that uh, what Paul Volcker did and the Fed did to finally get inflation under control followed several failed attempts to get inflation under control. And, and what had happened over the course of that long period of the great inflation is that the public had really come to think of higher inflation as the norm and to expect it to continue. And that's what, what made it so hard to get inflation down in that case. So it, it is very much uh, our view and my view that we need to act now forthrightly, strongly, as we have been doing, and we need to keep at it until the job is done to avoid that. We think we can avoid the, the kind of very high social costs that, that Paul Volcker and the Fed uh, had to bring into, into play in order to get inflation back down and set us up then for, for a long period of, of price stability. Um, you know, that that, that speech, the, the point really there was to deliver a, a speech that was narrowly focused on inflation, 
more direct and a lot shorter than a typical Jackson Hole speech. And I thought w that what was appropriate was a very, you know, kind of concise and fo focused message. To your question, uh, the message really was that the Fed has and accepts responsibility for price stability, by which we mean 2% inflation over time. That, again, to your, to your question, the longer inflation remains well above target, the greater the risk that the public does begin to see higher inflation as the norm. And that has the capacity to really raise the costs of, of getting inflation down. So finally, history cautions strongly against prematurely loosening policy. I, I can assure you that my colleagues and I are strongly committed to, to this project and, and we will keep at it until the job is done. I can also assure you that we never take into consideration external political uh, uh, considerations. You know, we, we, we are accountable to the public through Congress. That's, that's a very fundamental, important aspect of our work. But it, it, we, we do not, we, we, we focus solely on the goals that Congress has given us, and that's what we're going to do here. I think that, um, you know, that's really important because it's, it's clear that we could see, you know, political pressure coming to avoid economic costs when there could be claims from political players that, you know, inflation is back in its box, you know, long, long, long before it is. Um, Jim mentioned in his, his opening remarks that two years ago you moved to a to a new framework, flexible average inflation targeting, and I'm I'm bringing this up now because uh, again, just reiterating the point about trying to sleep better at night. You know, by many accounts, this move has created some more uncertainty in the market, as as Jim mentioned, and coming at a time when inflation now has increased so markedly. It creates concern that despite your stated resolve, the commitment to price stability has become less strong. Um, you know, should there be, should you consider modifications to this framework to assuage these concerns and better manage short-term expectations? So the, the framework, um, we, we uh, began the work on the new framework in uh, 2018 and we announced uh, the results in August of 2020. And it really followed 25 years basically of global disinflationary forces and and the problem was that monetary policy rates were were close to the effective lower bound much too much of the time much too close and even during good times so that meant that central banks uh, were having a hard time all over the world you know finding ways to support the economy when it was needed and that's why central banks including the fed resorted to things like forward guidance and asset purchases so that's that's why we did that but the changes that we made were were sort of ver a very mainstream part of, of of a literature around makeup strategies. But but really, the point of our framework changes, the point of all of them, was to, and we said this very clearly, was to have inflation expectations well anchored at two percent. That the, the the average inflation targeting idea was meant to support having inflation expectations. That is the goal at two percent, and the reason is that we believe that the public's expectations of future inflation will play an important role in the actual path of inflation. So that's the that is kind of the fundamental basis of our framework and to you know as I just discussed it is very important that inflation expectations remain anchored. I think the evidence today is that if you look at longer term expectations uh, by households, businesses and forecasters and also markets you'll see that they are pretty well anchored around 2%. Of course, short term expectations are, are higher because of high current inflation. And also the clock is ticking. As I mentioned, the longer that uh, inflation remains well above target, the, the greater the concern that the public will start to just naturally incorporate higher inflation into its economic decision-making. And our job is to make sure that doesn't happen. And we're committed to doing that job. It seems to me there's a chance it, 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 that the, uh... There's there's a real risk that the labor market uh, that the labor shortages persist. Does that create a risk that um, takes some of the ability to manage this process out of your hands? To the extent that there continue to be labor shortages, does that then feed into expectations that the public has about inflation, as you mentioned very prominently? Uh, well, I think you, I think you're right that if if it does turn out that we are in a world of a persistent labor shortage over time, that will be that'll be a challenging world for companies, and and it will certainly create upward pressure on wages and that sort of thing. 
today, the labor market is demand is very, very strong still in the labor market. We're still um, printing new payroll job numbers at a high level. Wages um, are, are running at, at, at elevated levels. And um, so we think by uh, uh, by our, our policy interventions, what we hope to achieve is a period of growth below trend, uh, which will take which will cause the labor market to get back into better balance and then that will bring wages back down to levels that are more consistent with two percent inflation over time that's that's what we're trying to achieve um the shock to labor supply that we got from the pandemic was large and unexpected and unfortunately persistent i will say that just in the very last um in the very last uh labor market report that we got last friday we did see uh, a welcome increase in labor force participation nonetheless still a full percentage point below where it was before the before the crisis and i i think it's important as a society that we that we have measures in place to to support uh, a strong labor market and high labor force participation and that goes beyond you know what we can accomplish with monetary policy you you've made some contrast to how things are different today what's different today from <clears throat> The, you know, the, the high inflationary period of the late 70s and, and early 80s. Uh, I guess some other distinctions are, I remember as a student in Boston in the early 80s, in the days before the internet, um, I remember seeing people actually line up at the Fidelity office to see the monetary aggregates released on a weekly basis. And, uh, you know, the way the money travels through the economy has changed dramatically since Milton Friedman first said that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. I'm just wondering, how do you respond when people look to the huge spike in government spending and say, I think you answered this in part in, in, in the first question, but that, you know, when you look at the huge spike in spending and say the Fed's printed all this money, so of course we have inflation. So I, I too, I graduated from college in 1975, uh, which was close to peak monetarism. And there, there was quite a focus on monetary aggregates. And I, I recall it just as you do. Um, so, to, to, to go to this current situation. So as part of our response to the pandemic, we did resort to uh, large asset purchases to address what were pretty severe disruptions in markets, and then also to support the economy and our balance sheet expanded dramatically. But remember that our, our purchases of securities don't actually increase the, the quantity of, of government obligations held by the public. They really change the mix because we issue bank reserves to pay for those securities. So we're not changing you know the the quantity of, of obligations that is not to say that that money growth wasn't high it was of course extraordinarily high in 2020 and then slowed down in 21 and now is now is quite sluggish and i i guess i would just say say it this way um whatever caused you know there are different theories on what caused the inflation that so suddenly jumped up uh out of the ground in march of 2021 whatever that cause was, the relationship between the money supply and inflation economic output has been uh, much more unstable than it was in Friedman's day for a very long time. And so uh, literally changes in monetary aggregates have, have not had a consistent, reliable relationship. They haven't been a good predictor of the economy or of inflation. Now, of course, the economy is ever changing and, and that too could change. Uh, you know, to where it is uh, important again. But but for now, and for, for really many years now, monetary aggregates don't play an important role in our formulation of policy. And we don't think they're generally a good way to think about policy or about inflation. It's more about demand and supply and things like that. Um, so that that's that's uh, where we would be on that. I, um, that, that actually calls to mind, you know, at Cato, we do have a strong aversion to a fully discretionary fiat money system. And so we do like to socialize and promote alternative frameworks that could <clears throat> policy and a market direction that eliminates some of this discretion. Jim mentioned that a consistent theme over the years of this conference has been, um, you know, potential, potential monetary rules. Um, and you know that kind of calls into question whether inflation and prices are really the best targets to use for monetary policy. Uh, some folks have advocated for a rules-based system, such as you know targeting nominal GDP, is something we've heard a lot about in recent years. Partly because, as you say, monetary policy is not suited to address, you know, well suited to address supply shocks. 
uh, could you share with us some of your thoughts of, of that type of approach and whether it's something that that uh, you, you would consider? So more broadly on rules, of course, um, Taylor rules have become part of the fabric of economic analysis and particularly monetary policy analysis in ways that that must be far greater than John Taylor could have hoped when he wrote his original article in uh, 1993. So, but but we, no central bank and the Fed has never explicitly tied our monetary policy decisions to any formula, including Taylor rules. But Taylor rules, nonetheless, are, are ubiquitous in in all of the work that we do. You, you have to have a very or you know a way and a model of of explaining how monetary policy will react, and some kind of Taylor rule is now is now very much part of the way. We think in terms of nominal income targeting, and I, by the way, I know that Cato and uh, is is one of the home courts for nominal income targeting, along with Mercatus and some others. And um, I, I know that this is a a lot of well known experts, many of them at, at your institution, um, you know, do support nominal income targeting. And, and I'll just say that you know we've looked at that, I've looked at that, and really come to the view that uh, that nominal income targeting is not the right way to go. And I'll try to explain why. By the way, I, I know that uh, these arguments are well known to nominal income targeters and will be found to be unpersuasive. But nonetheless, I'll just give yeah. you my, uh, yeah, my and, one, and one thing I would interject is that you know, we have debates internally as well. And I think for us, the concept really is more, um, you know, wanting to socialize a number of alternatives and try to move towards alternatives that do have more of a market basis and, and again, remove you know, remove discretion. Uh, to I, I think that's a very healthy process. And, uh, you know, the whole debate over many, many years about rules and discretion is is a uh, fascinating and important one that, that is far from over. So it's really a mix of the two, I think that 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 but but getting to, getting to your to, to nominal income targeting, you know, we've got a dual mandate, maximum employment and price stability. And it comes down to is uh, nominal income targeting the best way to promote that? We don't think it is. I don't really think it is. And and part of that just is that it would be, I think, very difficult to explain to the public the relationship of a nominal income target, nominal GDP target to to those goals. It's just it's it's a level of complexity that, you know, even some economists and policymakers struggle with, let alone the general public. So it seems like it would be a reach to to, to sort of put the you know, for, for us to have that be our fundamental um, uh, fundamental framework. And a, a couple of examples that would be difficult, one in particular would be, what do you do with changes in trend growth? We have, uh, uh, you know, highly uncertain estimates of, of levels of trend growth that we amend down through the years. And many years, you know, many years later, we may have very different view, but it is broadly understood, I think, or, or believed, thought that, that trend growth has declined consistent or considerably rather over the course of the last, well, since the global financial crisis. So how do you incorporate that into a nominal income target? Do you just raise the contribution of inflation or do you annually re-estimate trend growth? And if you do that, you're incorporating both communications issues, but also, uh, you know, just big chances of policy error because we just don't know these things with that kind of, we don't know any of the of the starred variables, so to speak, with, with that level of certainty. So I'll just say, it's it's uh, it's a re really interesting and it works very well in in models, but it seems difficult to implement from a practical standpoint, and, and it's not something that we that we have chosen to do or that we you know, are currently looking at. You mentioned the dual mandate. Um, you know, I don't want to ignore the unemployment rate during this conversation. Um, you know, when I said earlier that you know we obviously have an aversion to a you know, fully discretionary monetary system. Many of us also regret the adoption of the dual mandate uh, in lieu of a strict focus on monetary stability. Um, the Fed's own website acknowledges that maximum employment is driven mainly by non-monetary factors. And if we accept that, does it really make sense for employment to be part of the Fed's mandate? So Peter, as you know, uh, we are, uh, we're, created by Congress in statute and Congress assigns our goals and it has assigned maximum employment and price stability. It's my view that the dual mandate uh, has served the public well and is generally workable. In particular, at the moment, I don't see the two goals as in uh, conflict at all because without price stability, we, we, we will not be able to achieve the kind of strong labor market that we want for a sustained period that, that benefits all. So I, I don't see a case for moving to 
to a single uh, mandate. But that's that's really a question for Congress, and you know we will we will we will of course implement whatever mandate Congress gives us. To your point about maximum employment, it, it's true that, and we do say that that uh, uh, and have for some time that non-monetary factors are really what drives the level of maximum employment, which clearly changes, th you know, through the business cycle and over time. But we we can and do assess that, and we do it transparency. And and you know, Congress has said that should be a goal, a co-equal goal with price stability. So that's what we're implementing. And again, I wouldn't. I, I don't think there's a strong case for changing that. I don't think it hampers us in our pursuit. And I think we can achieve both goals in the medium term. You stole my follow-up because uh, you, you started <laughs> out saying Congress sets the mandate. And so I, my follow-up was gonna be, well, should the mandate, you know, should, should they consider changing the mandate? And I think you've uh, you've answered that. But uh, I guess a natural follow-up might be then that, you know, if the dual mandate weren't enough, there's been talk of adding more, um, you know, more more elements to you know the Fed's objectives, including <clears throat> like racial equity that seem you know far from the Fed's ability to address. Uh, in addition, you know, the Fed's remit has expanded from the banking system to the broader financial system, and its regulatory responsibilities were widely expanded in the wake of the financial crisis. Uh, you know, how does continuing expanding the Fed's mandates not undermine focus on that fundamental responsibility of, of monetary stability? you know, beyond things such as that, you know, the employment element of the mandate. I, so I think our, our current mandate is appropriate and I, and I do not, I would not want to see it narrowed or broadened uh, for that matter. We've got narrow and we've got well-defined goals that we're supposed to pursue. And what we get with that, what we've gotten with that is a precious grant of independence that lets us pursue those goals without direct political control. For monetary policy, that's maximum employment and price stability. And I think that dual mandate has served the public well. I, I, I really don't think it would, it would not be a good idea to broaden it to goals that might be inconsistent with those first two mandates and that would be very difficult for us to achieve with our tools. More broadly than that, though, I, I think it's really important that we stick to our assigned tasks and resist the temptation to take on issues that are the province of elected representatives or of Congress. And if we do that, if we do stray from our core mandates, that will eventually undermine the case for our remaining independent. And I, th I think, you know, Fed independence is an institutional arrangement that has served the public well. And I think that's that's pretty well documented and accepted. I mentioned a couple of times, you know, our concern <clears throat> about a fully discretionary system. And, and one of the biggest of those concerns is that in the face of, you know, large economic dislocations, um, you know, we've been running, you know, what really amount to unprecedented experiments. You know, I would I would cite the, you know, quadrupling of the Fed's balance sheet in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, and then you know doubling it again during the during the pandemic. Um, you know, to your credit, it was right before the pandemic that you were beginning to move towards reducing the balance sheet. Uh, could you shed some light for us on, on where you hope to take the balance sheet over time and and you know what's the way that you you know really really try to get there? Do you see the Fed ever moving back to a scarce reserve framework like it had before the 2008 crisis? Sure. So uh, in the last cycle, um, uh, after we ended our asset purchases, we froze the size of the balance sheet in 2014 and then allowed it to shrink passively relative to the size of the economy for about three years. So as the economy grew, <clears throat> the balance sheet didn't grow. Then in 2017, we began to allow uh, maturing assets to run off and that process went on until 2019. Uh, by the end of that period, we had a balance sheet that was significantly smaller relative to the size of the economy and smaller than, uh, than it was overall. So then we resumed asset purchases, as you know, 2020. And once again, now we are embarked on shrinking the balance sheet and, and the test will be back to levels that satisfy the public's demand for our liabilities. That's currency and reserves and things like that, but also with reserves maintained at levels that are consistent with our ample reserves regime. So the balance sheet is substantially larger now, obviously, and consequently the runoff process is, is designed to be substantially faster than it in the last cycle to the tune of on the order of a trillion dollars of runoff per year. That process began in June, once it's up to full speed. Process began in June and the pace of the balance sheet increases, uh, actually rises this month. The, the, the plans are spelled out in detail on our website around the January and May meetings. 
And of course, one thing we always say is that we're prepared to adjust the details of the plan based on economic and market developments at any time. As far as uh, returning to a scarce reserve regime, I, I, I guess I would say that I, uh, I think that our current operating framework is, is a better one, and, and I don't see a case for returning to scarce reserves. Now, why is that? So the world has, has really changed as a result of the global financial crisis and the pandemic. The scarce reserves framework would be challenged to work in a world where there's very high and sometimes volatile demand for safe and liquid assets. Central banks may need to rely on large scale asset purchases again from time to time in response to severe shocks. And, the, and remember that, that the large financial institutions hold very, very large quantities of safe assets now as a liquidity buffer, and in, that includes a lot of reserves. So. The bottom line is that the quantity of, of reserves is just so much higher, it's, it would seem to be impractical to try to manage scarcity, of, of, and, and demand will be volatile too. So it's, it doesn't seem practical. And again, we think that the current system works well and provides a lot of liquidity to the system, which is kind of a net gain. All right, I thought it might be time to uh, shift gears a little bit away from inflation and, and monetary policy. Um, I remember the first year I joined Cato, I read an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal advocating for the Fed to implement a digital currency. And uh, I was kind of horrified at the privacy implications of this pro prospect and, and said so in, in a letter to the editor at that time. <laughs> Since then, the Fed has formally stepped into the digital currency ring. And, and digital currency has obviously been a, you know, a very recurring theme in these conferences, but uh, the Fed has stepped into the, this arena with a discussion paper on a central bank digital currency and several speeches from Fed governors. You know, our team has reviewed the more than 2000 comments that the Fed's uh, central bank digital currency discussion paper received. And we find that about two thirds of them are concerned or outright opposed to the idea. Um, commenters raise concerns of financial privacy, financial oppression, and disintermediating the bank system, some of the same concerns that, that led me to, to write that letter to the editor seven years ago. Uh, how can these serious concerns about privacy and freedom be reconciled with a digital currency? Let me, let me start by saying that uh, we haven't made any decisions at all about whether to issue uh, a CBDC, and we continue to evaluate the pros and cons and look at the, the technical questions and the policy questions, and we expect that that evaluation process is gonna take some time, appropriately so. Finally, secondly, I'll say that we do not intend to proceed with issuance of a CBDC without clear support from both the executive branch and from Congress, ideally in the form of a specific authorizing law. So we did get, it was very gratifying, 2,000 uh, and some comments. And you know, I, I, I won't tell you that I've read those, but I've read uh, all, all of them, but I've read some of them and I've read the summaries. And you know, it's very, very, a lot of very thoughtful concerns, including the ones that you raised and there are things that we're considering very seriously. So we, we in, our, in our own paper, we, we suggested that a CBDC in our jurisdiction uh, should be privacy protected, intermediated, widely transferable, and identity verified. So on, on privacy protection, let's start with that. Very, very important. And you know, we all see what's, what's happening with, uh, with the, the uh, digital RMB. And, 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 you know, and the issues with privacy, we would not want a world in which the government sees in real time every money transfer that anyone makes with a CBDC. That would not be something that would be at all attractive in the American context. Uh, so privacy protection is going to be extremely important. And we're, we're attentive to striking a, a balance, of course, between law enforcement and privacy protection. But that can be managed in the same way that it's currently managed in the banking system or in some similar way. Um, in terms of uh, another another issue, really is uh, disintermediation, uh, and you know that that really is a question of if say you had a, an interest-bearing CBDC, it could be attractive, it could compete with deposits, could draw deposits out of the banking system, that could limit credit availability. That's another issue to be managed. I think one of the things that actually that that Cato mentioned in your uh, was was also the run risk issue and that that is the question of are you creating an asset that would be very attractive in you know in in a panic or severe stress situation and and uh, you know fostering runs so look it's it's going to be as i mentioned it's going to be uh, we think our role is this we want to carefully and thoroughly analyze the public policy and technological 
challenges, trade, public policy trade-offs and technological challenges. That's what we're doing. The idea is that w this will lead all of us to a better understanding of those trade-offs and prepare the way for hopefully a well-informed decision on whether and when to issue a dollar central bank digital currency. That, that's, that's what we think our role is. And um, we think that the Fed is, is the right institution to do that. We can, we can proceed without, you know, we're a nonpartisan uh, institution, non-political institution that can do these things and I hope present conclusions and analysis that will support an intelligent decision when it's time to make that. Well, this is something we'll definitely be having a lot to say on in the future um, as well, particularly from a perspective of, uh, you know, of, uh, of privacy, privacy concerns. That's been a, and being a watchdog on those issues you know, is a very important role for, for Cato. Um, I do want to ask about cryptocurrency, you know, but first I should probably in fairness reveal that the uh, the gentleman who photobombed Janet Yellen five years ago by holding up a buy Bitcoin sign behind her during her Humphrey Hawkins testimony uh, earlier this year became my son-in-law. So uh, that, that's a little bit of a disclaimer I'm going to put out there. Um, but without debating the merits uh, or future of cryptocurrencies generally or one or another crypto products, uh, I'll say that in the monetary arena, you know, Cato stands for nothing if not a desire to see more interest in monetary policy, to see more people uh, concerned about our discretionary fiat system. And also, we, you know, we want to see private market innovation and experimentation in developing alternatives. And, and crypto is just such a great example of this. Um, there's a long history of government and regulation of thwarting such innovation and experimentation, which, which uh, you know, we find really disappointing. So I wonder if you could respond to, to these kinds of concerns, namely that, you know, regulators might ultimately strangle <clears throat> You know, crypto to the extent that it really does develop into a viable alternative system. So, um, I'll talk about it in two pieces. One is is unbacked cryptocurrencies as such, and you know those have not and don't appear to offer, have not offered and don't appear to offer much in the way of uh, uh, public interest in using them as payments. Let's say it's really a. It's really, uh, a, uh, it's, and it's not a great store of value. What it is, is it's a speculative asset. It's not backed by anything. There could be an argument so, that that's still during the development phase and that it's something that we could see see uh, emerge. But, but yes, be that as it may. And I have, I also have close in family members who, who offer that perspective vigorously. <laughs> so, <laughs> as you suggest. Um, so, but stable coins is a different thing. And, uh, you know, the question is, are there forms of private money like stable coins, which can play a role in our financial system, which would, uh, and, and the answer is, of course, that, that we don't want to stand in the way of appropriate uh, innovation, particularly including, uh, you know, digital innovation. But we think that something like that, which is, you know, purporting to be money, would need to be appropriately regulated. And, and you know, I, I hear that wide agreement on that, by the way, from a lot of the stablecoin companies now are seeing that as part of the, of getting to a place where they are a legitimate part of the financial system. So, I, th I think you need regulation. If people people are going to think something is money, then it needs to actually have the qualities of money. And you know, many if it doesn't, then you you don't want. Um, I, I don't think you want to take money and make it into just another consumer product where sometimes it fails and sometimes it's good. You want it to be guaranteed to be good. If the public's going to look at it like it was a dollar. You want to have clarity, transparency. You want to have full reserves of very liquid, high-quality assets, and things like that. That's all. So, I and I and I think that I, I'm, I'm. We need we need legislation on this. Just you know, it, it's typical of of technological innovations. There isn't a regulatory framework that that really gets after payment stable coins. Uh, you know, and and so I think that's what's needed. But but don't I wouldn't think of us as being opposed to that kind of innovation. We're more the people who are saying, among others. That we need appropriate regulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it do doubles ultimately in the details. I mean, we, while while we have these debates, I mean, we would concede. You know, we're living in a world where we will see see innovation, and we basically promoted, you know, a light touch, you know, market focused approach because there is, you know, there is a real risk of of again. Um, you know, having uh, an, an impact on the development of these innovations and really thwarting what could be very promising, uh, promising and 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 useful uh, innovation. 
No, and I, I agree with that. It's we, we don't want to be in that place. We want to be in favor of, in, of innovation, but also appropriate regulation. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, some of the people who end up driving, you know, the, the, the regu regulation might be, uh, you know, as you, you mentioned legislation, um, you know, the end, end product may not meet the objectives that, that you and I both say that we want. Um, uh, another um, topic, you know, as long as I can remember, successive <laughs> chairman have warned of our unsustainable fiscal path. Uh, you know, regrettably, no one in Congress or the White House needs to be listening. Um, I'm, you know, particularly during a period of, of high inflation, I've been, you know, continually chagrined at, uh, you know, the, the, the number of, uh, of big spending bills that continue to come down the pike and legislation uh, that's passed, um, you know, long after I think that, you know, the crisis of the pandemic has, 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 uh, has, has ended. Um, the lessons of the financial crisis in, in COVID might be that keeping our fiscal house in order is essential as preparation to meet the challenges of unexpected but inevitable, you know, economic dislocations. But the opposite lesson seems to have been learned that we can keep spending, you know, whatever we wish without worrying about a day of reckoning. And I just, you know, I'm, I'm very concerned about the day of day of reckoning and and what risks we're laying for the economic well-being of future generations. And I just wonder, um, you know, your thoughts on on uh, on those concerns and, you know, the potential uh, timing of uh, of that day's arrival and its and its consequences, and uh, whether you have any ideas about how we can build a real constituency for uh, for fiscal responsibility in America. So I I do share those concerns, and in fact, I was working on those issues before I joined the Fed, but. At the Fed, um, I, my position is needs to be that fiscal policy really is the responsibility of Congress and the administration. Wouldn't be appropriate for me to, to comment too much on specific policy proposals or laws. More to the point, uh, with inflation running so far above 2%, this is probably an especially good time to focus on achieving our own mandate rather than doling out advice to others. Um, but like my predecessors, I'll point out that our, our federal fiscal policy is not on a sustainable path, and it really hasn't been for some time. And we will need to get, we will need to get back to a sustainable path sooner or later. To your point, sooner is better than later. And I guess I'll just leave it at that. All right, thanks. I, I, uh, we're getting close to the, uh, the end of our time, so I'm thinking about a, a closing question. Um, I wonder... Um, with everything that we've discussed thus far, um, what are some of the key lessons that you've learned since you became became Fed chair? And uh, you know, what advice might you give to a lot of the young, you know, monetary scholars out there that that Cato and other places are working to develop? So I I guess I would say that both experience and also studying history are are, are great teachers of uh, of what can be hard lessons, and I I, I actually mentioned. Uh, three lessons uh, at, uh, at Jackson Hole uh, 10 days ago. And those were first that the Fed does have and accept responsibility for price stability. Uh, even now, some, some are questioning that, but that to us is, is settled. Secondly, that inflation expectations are really important and need to be carefully monitored because if they do move up, they can make the job of getting back to price stability so much harder. And third is that, you know, the record is uh, of the, there is a record of failed attempts to get uh, 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 inflation under control, which only raises the, the ultimate cost to society of getting under control. Hence, the need to do this job now and keep at it. So those those are three lessons. I would say more broadly, another really fundamental uh, lesson is to me is that the structure of the economy is is ever changing and and highly complex. And you know we see that today. Uh, around the world, many nations are experiencing the, the first high inflation in 40 years. All around the world, different countries have different compositions and backstories, but it's really quite global. And the question really is, is this going to be a temporary thing that's really related to the pandemic in some way, or is there actually something more structural and persistent happening? For example, if we're moving to a world where uh, we're going to see more frequent, larger, and more persistent supply shocks for whatever reason. That will have critical uh, and difficult implications for the conduct of economic policy and monetary policy in particular. So this this is not possible to know right now, but it's certainly a question that, that looms. 
I mean, the, to me, the, the, to sum it up, it, 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 I would just say economics is not physics. There isn't any specific temperature at which the economy boils over. It does boil over from time to time. And, and when that happens, it often takes many years of analysis, discussion, and debate to reach general agreement on why that has happened. So the point is that we, we are always making monetary policy under high uncertainty about the structure of the economy and the path ahead. That makes our work challenging. Uh, it also makes it getting it right very important for the people that we serve. And we, we do think about that every day. So our, our understanding of the economy has to evolve as the economy evolves. As time passes, we do learn more. And I think it's OK to follow the evidence and, and, and change one's mind. I think advice to scholars, young and old, is that people shouldn't be afraid to say that they've changed their view and explain why. Uh, I actually find that refreshing when when people say, you know, my view, I've, my view has evolved in, in the face of the evidence. Um, I, I guess one more word to close to for for those young researchers you mentioned. And this this is a commercial for for public service and for the Fed. So the Fed is a, is a very special place where uh, people can combine policy re research with policy making. This is a place that has all of us have a very strong sense of mission in our work, which is very satisfying. And that mission is to serve the public. And it really matters. Our work really matters to the public. I would say there's no higher calling or more satisfying mission. So I hope that young researchers and economists and others will consider public service as part of their of their career. For me, it's been only a part. Um, uh, but in particular, consider uh, consider working at the Fed, where you'd be most welcome. Thanks for that. I mean, I share those sentiments. As you know, you mentioned your your uh, your work at the Bipartisan Research Center, and and uh, you know, I'm at Cato because I care about the future of our country and the future course of of liberty and and freedom in America, and for the kind of uh, kind of world uh, you know future generations are going to grow up and whether they're going to have the same opportunities that that we all have had to live in a free country and to uh, to pursue. You know their American dream, and 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 being part of that is uh, is a real real privilege. Um, I know you know at Cato we work very hard to raise consciousness of uh, of monetary policy and the potential for for monetary reform. Uh, we wish that you know we think this is a very important topic, and that that more Americans should should pay attention to it, even though it's complicated. Uh, we wish there were more policy organizations that would prioritize. Uh, this policy area and 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 you know raise their level of resources dedicated, you know, to this area. And uh, as you know, um, Mr. Chairman, you know, Cato is not shy about about being critical, and and we enjoy intellectually jousting uh, with with uh, with you and your team. But we also recognize that um, you know we share uh, common uh, you know goals and objectives uh, for for our country, and it's uh, in the country's best interests by which that uh, that jousting and those those uh, uh, debates and uh, areas of uh, of disagreement. It's in, it's it's within that context that that they occur, and so I do thank you for uh, for your work. Um, you're in a challenging position, and and I uh, thank you very much for for being part of this conference today. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks, Peter. The pleasure is mine too. Thanks so much. And uh, with that, I'm just going to let all the viewers know that we're going to be taking a break now until the top of the hour. So we're going to reconvene with the, uh, the next panel at, uh, at 10 a.m. Uh, so we'll see you then. Uh, Chairman Powell, thanks very much again. Have a great day. My pleasure, you too.